Right on, dude. Uh, excited to have you on here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, uh, I've, I've read, let's see here, Obstacle is the Way, Ego's the Enemy, uh, I'm Halfway Through, uh, Stillness. Uh, I absolutely love those. I didn't know about your earlier work. I found you later on. Yeah. And when we, we were trying to get you on the show a while back when we were out in Austin, the stuff that actually, which is funny, because I had all these things that I wanted to talk to you about with stoicism and everything, but when I actually started digging deeper into you, I actually became really fascinated with the marketing side. Yeah. And so for our audience, uh, I'd love for you to kind of share your early history and how you got into the marketing and sales side, and then we'll we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah, I don't know where to start. I mean, it's weird. It it seems weird to say it now, but so in 2012, I wrote a book about how fake news is made. Uh, And everyone basically said I was crazy and a liar and totally wrong. Um, the book, the book weirdly, like, it was like everyone in the media saw the book and was like, he's a bad person. You know, this book is not true. And then sort of actual people in marketing and people in politics, people had messages they wanted to get out. Um, they have very different reaction and they sort of become, (laughs) were you like the guy giving away the, the, the magician's tricks or whatever? Well, no, no, it was was more like people like, Oh, that's Mm. how it works. Mm. Um, and like. Some good people, you know, I've heard from people, hey, I use this to raise a bunch of money for this charity or, you know, hey, like this is how I broke through as a musician. And that's all really cool. And then it's also like, oh, hey, I'm the guy that gave Donald Trump the idea for the wall. And trust me, I'm lying. It's my favorite book. And you're like, you know, like <laughs> uh, so it's it's a little it, it's 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 sort of a strange book. So like, uh, many years ago, Michael Lewis wrote this book called Liar's Poker, which is like sort of about the excesses of Wall Street. And I remember reading an interview about it and he said, people come up to me and they go, you're the reason I work on Wall Street. And he's like, that's literally the exact opposite intention I had with the book. That's sort of the rea- the the relationship I have with that book. I mean, I, I totally, I feel like it, it stands the test of time. I feel like it's right. I also feel like it's a little bit of a sort of a piece of time in my life. Um, but I think a, a lot of people miss that it was primarily a cautionary tale, not a how-to book. Right. What, what motivated you to write a cautionary tale about how fake news is made and how media is manipulated or used? Yeah, so I, I, I'd been a marketer for a long time and I'd worked with a lot of really controversial clients. And so I sort of saw how easy it was to like just create controversy and attention out of nowhere. Um, and I mean, little things. I remember when, so even with the book, I was like, okay, let me... People aren't going to believe me, so I'll just prove that I know what I'm talking about. So, like, for instance, I just announced that I got a half a million dollar book deal, which wasn't true. Uh, and the next thing, no, everyone's talking about it, right? How did this kid from nowhere get a half million dollar book deal? No one bothered to go, like, was well, it true or not? <laughs> and then, and then, then I leaked that it was a celebrity tell-all about like clients that I had, which also wasn't true. <laughs> and then everyone's like, what's the what? What sort of scoops are going to be in the book? So it was like this had this big pre-publication buzz, and then I did this thing. You guys know what Help a Reporter Out is? Mm-hmm. It's like a basically it's like Craigslist for lazy journalists. Okay. Like if you if you're like, hey, I'm writing about I'm writing a trend story about X I need an expert who will pretend to like who I need an expert who will tell me exactly what I want to put in my story I see so if I'm like you know most trend pieces are total bullshit and so it's just the reporter trying to be like oh this person says it's a trend and this person (coughs) says it's a trend therefore Therefore, it's it's a trend Uh. so there's a service that does this, right? You pay a membership fee. I had no idea. Yeah, you pay you pay a fee to be an expert, and then reporters go like, hey, I'm looking for someone to say that uh, kids are having sex with yo-yos, and then you go, oh, I'll give you a, you know, I'll- Shut I'll, up, I'll, uh, that I'll, work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why you'd ask me to be an expert in your story, and I'd tell you all about it. <laughs> but so, so the point is, uh, I signed up for the service, and I just pretended to be an expert about a bunch of things I had no idea what I was talking about. I was quoting, <laughs> in the New York Times as an expert on vinyl records. Like <laughs> I, I, I learned from the New York Times piece that I was quoted in what LP stood for. Like I'd never listened to a record in my life. I'm 25 when this happened, right? So, uh, you know, quoted, I was quoted on the Today Show and Dateline and all these different outlets about, you know, like preposterous nonsense, like how to winterize your boat. And, uh, you know, like, how millennials are afraid of investing in the stock market, just like ridiculous stuff. Uh, Every, basically every major media outlet you could think of. 
Uh, and then I like, rev- I was like, look, guys, this is how the sausage gets made. Like, uh, and people were like, you're a liar. <laughs> Why did you do this? And it's, I was like, guys, I'm not the problem here. The problem is that you a al- lot that it would take two seconds for the New York Times to ban their reporters from using this service. Mm. They don't want to do it because they have to churn out so much content. So mm. the, anyways, the, the book was supposed to show just how flimsy most of the information that we get from the media is and how, how the, this sort of page mentality that we have and the sort of free news mentality that we have is responsible for a lot of just false information. Mm. Um, and and the point was like, look, if I can do this for fun as an experiment, you know, what can Russia do? That's sort of the argument. Right? Oh yeah. Now is oh, this yeah. be- is this a, re- a symptom of the kind of unlimited bandwidth that uh, new technologies created in the sense that now there aren't just a few national, you know, newspapers. Yeah. There's an infinite number that I can post. That, so I really don't care if I put bad stuff out or it's less that. It's more like. Uh, an example, I have a job posting in the book, and this is from like 2015, so I, I've updated the book a couple times. But like in 2015, the Washington Post put out uh, a help wanted ad for a blogger to post 12 times a day. Like you just imagine the pressure of someone <laughs> has to write 12 articles a day. Like after nine, you're just like, I don't care. I don't even have time to think about this, right? So so part of it's the pressure. But the big part of it is like, if you think about what yellow journalism was, right? G- going back to the beginning of the 1900s, a city like New York had 20 or 30 daily newspapers. And so you remember that idea of like a newsboy, like extra, extra, right. read all about it. What was driving the crazy like uh, excesses of journalism in that time was that the newspapers had to... Sh- fight for attention on a street corner. Right. Well, now we have that, except for it's called Google News, and it's called Facebook, and it's called Twitter. So it's it's the systemic sort of uh, structure of the media creates an environment where nobody has time to really do a lot of real reporting, and nobody, like, people go, like, why, why does the media give Donald Trump $2 billion worth of free publicity in 2016? It's like, because they they made money off the free publicity mm-hmm. that they gave them. Mm-hmm. So is this, are you seeing in politics, are you seeing each side uses to their advantage in the sense of, for example, I remember somebody shared some article with, and it was a, a it was a bash liberal, you know, mm-hmm. article about like, look at these crazy liberals and what they're, what they're talking about. And you're reading this tweet supposedly written by a liberal. And you're like, Oh my God, that's insane. I right. can't believe that. And then I'm like, wait a minute. I wonder if, the conservatives are finding some crazy tweet sure. that nobody really believes in, but they're sharing it to show how crazy they are. The they other definitely side is- are. And, and and look, this is when when people talk about the Russian election interference, they think it was like hacking into these polling stations, and that was like kind of part of it. But mostly, it was that like I think something like eighteen hundred fake Russian accounts like Twitter accounts, were quoted in media stories wow. in the election. 1,800? So, yeah. So so, so when you think about, like, when I when I do this help a reporter out thing and I'm, you know, pretending I'm an expert on vinyl records, people go, oh, that's not that bad. Uh, how could they catch? Well, the problem is they shouldn't be using random fucking people on the internet as mm-hmm. sources for stories because when you do that, it creates vulnerabilities. So then Russia can, like, uh, take a fake Russia can have a person that that um, uh, like pretends to be an extreme liberal or pretends to be an extreme conservative, and then it just widens the divide between people. So, mm. like, I don't really think like look, I think there's a lot of alarming political things happening right now, but I don't think that magically in the course of just a couple of years. A, everyone suddenly became racist and suddenly got right. all these super extreme views on either side. I think. It, it's clear that uh, the 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 more polarizing the information we get, the more likely we are to share and react mm-hmm. to it on social media. And I think that's driving what feels or is perceived as increased polarization. But like, I don't know about you, but like, I don't get in any political conflict in my actual real life. No. <laughs> you know no. what I mean? I have a lot of reasonable conversations with people that I have very different beliefs with but very rarely do i hear anyone say anything dumb or overtly racist or you know uh 
I, I don't see anyone enforcing this extreme political correctness in real life either. I think it just exists almost entirely It's such on a internet. small, small, small percentage uh, of people. I, I mean, when I was a kid, there was a magazine called The Inquirer, and uh, there was these, these other magazines that were at the newsstands when you'd go through in the line at the grocery store, and you'd read about, like, wolf, you know, mother gives yeah. bo- you know, yeah. birth to four wolf kids or whatever. And after a while, you, you're like, okay, this, the whole thing is bullshit. Do you think we're heading down that path where everyone's going to be like, at first it's kind of getting us all wire, you know, all, all hopped up, and now at some point we're going to be like, eh, it's all bullshit. Well, I think one of the good one of the good things is that people are starting to re- like since the election, uh, the subscription rates for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, very different papers, the, from, but from different ideological viewpoints, have gone way way up. People mm-hmm. have realized like, oh. Uh, the news I get for free is like kind of worth what I pay for, it, right? You <laughs> yeah. know, and actually one of the, I, so I think one we're realizing you got to pay for quality, but two I also think podcasts like the the podcast the the economics of podcasting so much better than uh, a lot of the you know than than the sort of uh, the blogging world. So like look, people subscribe to this show. Uh, you know, you guys have a- literally hours. You it's know, long to get form. Your, it's long form. Podcast episodes don't go viral, right? Like mm-hmm. it's, it's. hey, I'm going to sit down and listen to these guys talk for 90 minutes. Like that's not simple. Think about 140 characters versus a 90 minute thoughtful meandering discussion with real people. Like it just so fundamentally better. Yeah. Bullshit tends to get aired out in long mm-hmm. form. You don't get those like short, you know. Yeah, or even talk radio. It's like they're just trying to rile you up and then get you to stick around through right. the commercial break. Like you guys aren't doing that. Mm-hmm. And and so I think podcasts are, are, I think we are starting to see some technological, some economical, but then also some some cultural shifts that are maybe making things better. I mean, the the big thing, I talk about this in the new book, like people need to stop fucking watching cable news. Like it is the worst, <laughs> worst thing for society, for your health, like for Agreed. being informed, mm-hmm. like, uh, and, and like w- watching the news is maybe one thing. Like if they were like, hey, this plane crashed and we are going to give you this information. The problem is like 90% of the news is a bunch of morons sitting around a table telling you their opinion about the plane crash, right? Like sports sports news is is like shows shows us really bad. It's like uh, I was watching a panel this morning as I was eating breakfast because it was on in the place I was eating and they were just like, like Antonio Brown did X and then it's like, what's our opinion about Antonio Brown and doing that's the X? Whole show. That's yeah. not that's not news, right? That's that's like that's just people who don't know what they're talking about telling you what they think is going to happen. Meanwhile, they're never accountable whether they're right or wrong. So that just like uh, people need to if you want to be happier, you want to be more informed, you want to be able to think big picture and have good ideas like that's sort of what I call stillness. Like you need to stop watching the news. I watch zero news. And actually, like when I'm in the airport, you know, CNN pays for their channel to be played in airports. Like any airport you're in, they're playing CNN. They're not just like, because, oh, this is the most trusted name in news. They're getting paid. This is a transaction. Really? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so, so like, I, when I walk through the airport, I'm like, I'm not going to fall for this. You know, like, I'm not going to watch this. But, but you actually have to, it's harder to sit there and read a book. Yeah. Then it is just go like, oh, what Donald Trump said, you know? Right. And so you got to get away yeah, from yeah. that. What, what do you think is is most alarming about all what we're seeing right now? I mean, I think the most alarming trend generally is like, we all live in very different realities from each other, right? So instead, like, so some people think X and some people think Y about a pretty objective set of events. You know what I mean? So like, like we're, are we getting further apart? Than I, I think so because we just consume such, which is ironic in a time where we are most connected. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We're literally connected, but we live on different planets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, something's crazy when you go in, on these network news channels and there's some kind of an event and you'll watch CNN or, and Fox and it's reported completely differently. And I, mm-hmm. I actually do this. This is something that I try. I learned this practice. I this sometimes I too. learned this practice years ago from a client who I had this client who was, ex, she was exceptional at arguing her position, and she always told me the way that she does that is she learns the other side as sure. well as as her side. So what I started doing is I'd go, I'd watch Fox, and I'd flip between Fox and MSNBC on the same <laughs> thing, and I could see like, wow, this is the same 
event, but completely different yeah, completely perspective. Different narrative. Yeah, completely. It, it, it's just it's just siloing us into different silos. Of- yeah, and look, this is just reality television, but way more boring than you know good reality <laughs> television. You know, so it's just it's just really. Bad. I mean, think about. Like what Donald Trump is, and again, I don't think this is a political statement. Donald Trump is the greatest reality television uh, character and producer in history, right? And he managed to turn our political system into one endlessly fascinating, uh, riveting reality show of which he is the star and prime beneficiary. And people can't seem to understand that if you just turn it off, it loses most of its power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you have the power. He's, he's, I, I'm not. Do you uh, think he's beatable? Do you think he's beatable in the next re-election? No, he's got to be the he's best so, politician. It seems I've like seen. he's so, so far ahead in that, in that area. Well, well, look, he's a horrible politician. He is a great, uh, he's a great acquirer of attention. Mm. Politician has to accomplish things. Oh, get I see things what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Politics is a, is a, is an art. It's a profession. It's a craft. Like how do you, uh, broker compromises. How do you pass legislation? Donald Trump has passed like precisely zero pieces of legislation. Uh, well, I guess he did the tax cut, which I don't have a huge problem mm-hmm. with. Uh, but like, um, as far as politics goes, actually the strategy is abysmal. He's probably left a lot of easy gains on the table, but what he is really good at is making the news cycle all about him. Um, yeah, I think he's probably beatable if, if these people can can it's like uh, the what I the analogy I make with Donald Trump is that Donald Trump is running like a no huddle offense, um, which every once in a while someone will bring to the NFL and it will kind of catch teams off guard and then they figure it out right. and then it stops working. But it's like we just see like liberals seem to not be able to figure out what he's doing and they just fall for it like every time. Yeah. You know, along the lines of media attention and uh, even talking about your book, Stillness is the Key. You know, it was really interesting that you, that was the most recent book that you read. One of the things, one of the messages that we give on our show all the time is the importance of digital wellness. Yeah. Uh, we think that's going to be one of the, the biggest things talked sure. about in the next decade. Can you kind of speak on that a little bit? What you, how important you think that is for us to maybe detox from sure. all this? Have you guys had Cal Newport on? Not no, yet, no. but I know oh, I'm going to listen to Yeah. So the idea of digital minimal and just being intentional, like what I, the way I think about it is like, I want to use technology. I don't want to be used by technology. And I don't think people realize, for instance, when we're talking about the news, like the news is free because it's selling you. They are creating a show over here, and then when your eyes are on it, they then go, "Hey, look, we got these people, and they're watching this." Great they point. S- they sell like it, uh, the joke is like, if you're not paying for it, you're the product that's being sold. Mm. And so uh, you've you've got it. You want to be using the technology, not the technology using you. So like deciding to be intentional about these things. So like, I don't have any social media on my phone on purpose. It's not that I don't use social media. It's that I don't carry it around in my pocket and have it at arm's reach all the time. Um, My rule is like, I don't touch my phone or use my phone for the first 30 minutes to one hour of the day. So I don't sleep with it in, in, in my room. I don't try not to use it as an alarm clock. So that means like I'm starting the day with like a nine hour no phone streak. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. And and it's it's really important uh, that like, so what happens is people wake up and then they the first thing they do is touch their phone and then they start the day from a reactionary place. They like start the day on the back, on their back foot. It's like, I, and this morning was a great example. I had to use my phone as an alarm clock. I'm staying in a hotel. And so like, you know, I go to turn off the alarm and then the first, when you click the phone, it's like all these things. Uh, Thankfully, I don't have any notifications on my phone except for text messages. Um, Like I don't get emails that way. I don't let CNN tell me anything. I don't let Instagram tell me anything. But the the point is like, uh, it was just business and friendship related stuff. Like, so instead of waking up and going, how do I want this day to go? What do I need to do today? What place do I want to come at from this day? It's like, oh, so-and-so gave me bad news or like, oh, this got canceled or like instead of, uh, so as a writer, it's really important that I enter my work from the right headspace and that I'm sort of driving things. So 
that idea of just not starting the day with the phone is really important for me. Mm. Do you think that because of uh, the the ease of distractibility today, the, the you know the social media, we're talking about tech, the way media is, do you think that's why we may be seeing a resurgence of these ancient uh, philosophies that you write so much about? Uh, Stoicism seems to be having a like a resurgence in popularity, and maybe that's because I'm more aware of it, or or is that even true? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. When I went out with the first book that I wrote about Stoicism, this would have been in 2012, no one was like, oh, this is so timely. Mm. Uh, this is going to be a huge trend. Um, it, it, in fact, they were like, what is this? How is this going to help people? Uh, they were very skeptical. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how things have panned out. What I've really found is that as much as things have changed, like human beings are still human beings. And so when you read about the Stokes, they're talking about how, like I, I opened the, the, the first pages of Stillness is the Key with this story of, of Seneca who's in Rome. He's trying to sit at his desk and write something. And the noise from the street and from the, you know, the floor below him and the room next door was like literally indistinguishable from the uh, what I was hearing from Fourth Avenue in San Francisco this morning, right? Um, it as it might be sirens as opposed to shouting, um, or you know, it, it might be like slightly like the the specifics might have changed a little bit, but the fundamental reality it's really hard to concentrate when it's noisy outside remains the same. And and the truth is we there's not really anything new you can discover about doing it. There's just kind of some bedrock principles and practices that you want to follow that help you focus, that help you, you know, clarify what you want to do, that help you, you know, be your sort of your best self. Mm. Why do you think it's become more popular more recently? I mean, I think it's a couple things. I, one of the things I've really tried to do in the books is, is be a understanding of the fact that like, okay, I'm a nerd. I love history. I love philosophy. So I wake up and go, well, let's study this or let's study that. Most people don't do that. Most people wake up and they go, I'm depressed or I don't like my job or I'm scared about X, Y, or Z. Most people wake up and say, I have a problem. And they are not primed to think, hey, ancient philosophy from Greece and Rome or from China or Japan could be the perfect solution to that problem. Um, as far as they know, you know, philosophy is like some turtleneck university professor lecturing them using a bunch of words that they can't pronounce. And so I've really tried to combat that and try to present philosophy actually as a practical set of exercises or ways of thinking. I'm, I'm trying to actually make the case that no philosophy is actually exactly what you need and it's designed as a solution to your problem. So I think that's a big, I think that's that like meeting people where they are has, has, has helped. The other thing is I do think people are realizing they're like, okay, I don't go to church. I don't believe, you know, what the media tells me. I don't, um, I don't have a, you know, I'm not going to work at this company for the next 30 years. I don't trust politicians. I hate my parents or whatever, like all the old sort of things that kind of gave you a sense for how to live have fallen away. And then people are like, oh, well, what should I do or not do? Mm -hmm. You know, what are good rules for living? I think Jordan Peterson's book worked really well because he was like, look, here are some rules for living. And people are like, thank you. Mm -hmm. I need some rules Simple. for living. Yeah. yeah. How do you define stoicism? Um, so look, you could you could tell people, hey, this is what year it was founded in in ancient Greece, and these are the big, you know, these are the names and this uh, the way I describe it is that Stoicism is a, is a philosophy that believes we don't control what happens in life, we control how we respond, right? And the sort of core things that the Stoic wants you to respond to life with, or the sort of traits to live by, are courage, justice, temperance, that's moderation, and wisdom. And so it's it's not it's it's hardly controversial, right? It's not like asking you to do anything you don't already agree with. It's just giving you a sense, like sort of a code for living, and and I think these are the kind of bedrocks of bedrock uh, values of a good life. Yeah, there's two of them that you mentioned there: courage and temperance. That I could see 
being extremely challenging uh, these days. Courage because in order to be courageous, you have to embark on something you're terrified of, something that's very challenging. Yeah. And we've just made life super easy and we continuously try off. to do that. Yeah. Yes. And then temperance, uh, moderation. I, I, you know, and we see this a lot in our space, in the fitness and health space. These pleasure seekers who are like, you know, if it feels good, it is good. Sure. And keep pushing. I mean, what is your opinion on some of that? Yeah, look, uh, we we used to have this idea of sin, right? Like, don't do this or, you're, or you'll go to hell. Right. Right? And that obviously was sort of repressive and, you know, uh, if you're not religious, like it's... Yeah, because like, you don't believe it? in hell, well then fine. Yeah. So, so the Christian argument is like, don't do thing, don't do these bad things or don't, you know, do things in excess or you will die and go to hell. The Stoic argument is like, a person who has no self-control lives in hell, mm. right? That these things that you think are pleasures are actually uh, like the worst thing I could do is give you everything that you want. So for the Stokes, it's all about balance. It's not. It's not that you can't have. It's not you can't take a drink, or you can't have sex, or you know you can't uh, you know strive to be uh, great at what you do. It's just you can't lie to yourself and, and tell yourself that that's uh, an unlimited amount is okay and that it's going to mean anything in the long run to you, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just see these people who, who there's just nothing is ever enough for them, right? There's not any amount of money that's enough, not any amount of accomplishment that is enough, any amount of partying or sex or adulation or fame is enough. And this is actually just a miserable, awful way to live. Oh, yeah. As evidenced by the rate of depression and suicide you see among celebrities. Sure. People who have uh, almost all of those things all the time or whenever they want. Well, what happens is we think, oh, if I get what I want, then I will be happy. And then what we forget is that the mind insidiously just moves the goalpost a little bit further mm -hmm. each time. I mean, I thought, oh, I, I, all I want to do is be a writer. Then I'll, you know, and it's like, Okay, what does a writer do? A writer has a book. So then I did a book. And it's like, oh, this got to be a bestseller. Mm. It's like, actually, now I need to do a second book and I want to get paid more for it. And then, you know, you just go on and on. And, and it's like, it never occurs to us like, hey, last time I told myself, if I get this thing, then I'll, be, then I'll feel good. And then I didn't feel that good. But we go, oh, it was just not enough. Mm. I, you know, it was like, I thought I needed a million dollars. Turns out, actually, it's 10. That's what addiction sounds like. Of um, course. We, we were talking about how we interviewed um, uh, Mark Manson, yeah. and he wrote his book, and it crushed, and he was depressed afterwards because of exactly what you're talking about. No, I, uh, Mark's a good friend. We, I remember seeing him, this is maybe 18 months after it had really popped, we were hanging out, and he was like, he was, I don't want to say he was like a shell of himself, but you could tell he was kind of shell-shocked by all of it, like, because... Uh, it was so out of, I don't think it was like, I don't think Mark was someone who was like, oh, if I'm really a famous, successful author, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. I think he's, he's way too smart and, and wise to think that. I think it was more like, it was such a, a, an overwhelming amount of success that he was dealing with what happens, like we're talking about, when things are out of balance. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, it just, it took him a while to figure out how to balance his life out. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember he was saying, he was like, he decided he was going to start eating better and working out and taking better care of himself and developing more of a schedule. I think, ironically, throwing himself into the next book was probably the best thing he he ended up doing. And that's something I've 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 worked on in my career. Like when when the obstacles away came out, it did well. Like it it didn't like blow the doors off, but it did well. Um, but I'd already sold what was going to become Ego as the Enemy, so it was sort of like. Um, the fact that it, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't pop. Like I didn't care. I had like a deadline to meet. You know, like I had work mm -hmm. to do. Um, and then when it really blew up, when it really started selling, um, it also didn't matter because like I still had to deliver this book, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes like the best thing is just to like go back into the work. Mm -hmm. You know, like and I think that's why you know you hear of like a Nick Saban or a Dabo Sweeney who it's like they win a national championship and then they're like on a recruiting trip the next day. Mm -hmm. It's not that they can't enjoy it. It's that they know um, that 
that it's better not to sit there and pat yourself on the back too much. I think they understand that it's the journey more than the destination. Of course. Yeah, you get know? right back on the journey again. Yeah. You're, 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 you're reminding me of, um, you know, as you're talking about some of these philosophies and, and this non-identification or, or not worshiping these things, it reminds me of like the Beatitudes and Christianity or the Eastern religions and how they talk about, you know, detachment. Um, sure. I feel like this, this, these lessons are echoed in all these, all over the world, which kind of shows that they're probably true. But all of these teachings that have been around for a long time, there's always a metaphysical aspect that's connected, whether it's God or something outside of, you know, otherworldly. Yeah. Can these these teachings or, or understandings, can they be just as effective if you don't believe in the metaphysical, if you're, let's say you're an atheist? Yeah, yeah. I So, so the Stoics were not, the Stoics come at this interesting point in history sort of as the idea of the gods are kind of falling away. Mm-hmm. But like uh, God, it like the the sort of monotheistic God that we have in the West now has not sort of, is not really taken hold the same way. Like Jesus and Seneca were born in the same year. Okay. So like it, it's kind of like these things are all swirling about at the same time, which is why I think there's a lot of similarities. But I think... Stoicism and Christianity are making very similar arguments, but I feel like uh, Stoicism is arguing it more from a logical standpoint. Like, a, hey, you're here right now. Do you like? Let's look at what works and what doesn't work, and what what is sustainable and isn't sustainable. And then, yeah, in Christianity, there's there is more of like this is what God thinks you should do. Um, I'm not super picky and choosy about like how you get there. I think it's just important that you get to a place where you're balanced and centered, where you have a strong moral compass, where you make good decisions, where you don't take life for granted, you know, all, all where you, you, you treat other people well. I think there's lots of ways to get there. I think philosophy is a, is probably the most robust and practical way to get there. But like, look, if, if, if you want to go to church every weekend and that, that's what does it for you, like, you know, great. Or if you want to go to meditation retreats every weekend and that's how you get there, cool, good for you. The point is that you're doing the work. This this stuff doesn't just happen. You don't just get to sort of enlightenment and inner peace and and sort of wisdom uh, by playing video games. <laughs> Ryan, was, you, oh, yeah, so did, go ahead, Justin. Oh, yeah. Did you have a specific code that you grew up with that um, maybe like later on you found stoicism that really resonated with you but what what did that look like growing up in terms of you trying to figure all this out yeah i i in a way i almost wish that i'd had more sort of explicit stuff like i don't think we talk about these things yeah. enough um i don't know if i could have i don't know i knew the 10 commandments existed i don't know what they were right we we kind of have this weird thing now i think particularly educationally where it's like we don't want to teach people too clearly right and wrong because it feels like loaded. Totally. Like I was thinking about, you know, the story of, uh, you know, uh, George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't learn that story. I learned how that story is not true. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like they want they wanted to be like, hey, you know that story that we used to teach uh, kids about why lying is a good <laughs> idea and why it's good to be honest? Like yeah, like that's bullshit, <laughs> right? Like just I, you, I need you to know that's bullshit. You know, <laughs> okay, thanks. It's, yeah, yeah, it's important. It's important that you know that George Washington was a liar and a hypocrite, and they owned slaves, and that all the founding fathers sucked. And uh, you know what? Like so, it almost like we've knocked down everything, and then what's left is this kind of nihilism. Like mm-hmm. people don't know what to do and what not to do. That's what I've always not gotten about the outrage about Jordan Peterson. People are like, oh, well, it's like. There are a lot worse people uh, yeah. that like dudes could be listening to than than Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan. It's like, would you ra- what would you rather these people be at you know alt right rallies? Like jo- uh, Joe Rogan is t- telling them to like read you know these these crazy complex books and he's getting them to check out these college professors and he's telling them to take care of themselves. So like, th- what are you upset about? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's so, that's so absolutely true. And one thing that worries me a little bit, and you kind of touched upon this is the air of moral relativism that seems to be sure growing a little bit now where we're not, uh, it, we're, it's like we shy away from teaching. Okay, no, this is objectively right. And this is objectively wrong. 
rather it's all from your perspective and it's all okay. I mean, how do you feel about that? Yeah, like I don't think I don't think they used to think the George Washington chopping down the cherry tree story was true. I think they they were telling it because they wanted to yeah. teach a lesson, a moral parable about you know, I, teaching through story is how people learn. And sometimes you round the facts off to to make the point of the story clearer. And I kind of do that with my books too. Every once in a while people will be like, oh, you know, what about this? Or, you know, they'll be like, oh, you know, John D. Rockefeller also polluted the environment or whatever. And it's like, that doesn't change the fact that he was very disciplined in this other aspect of his life and that we can learn from him. Mm-hmm. So we have this weird, I, I actually saw this with Trust Me, I'm Lying. People wanted to go like, oh, well, what about X? This should invalidate his whole book. It, like, we have this weird thing where we need, like, totally pure... Uh, they don't exist. Yeah, no, it doesn't exist at all. And and so when it's like we... It's almost like the real cancel culture is like ha- we're, we're almost actively working to just undermine everything that might be of value to people. And then nobody's proposing anything. Mm-hmm. Like, like, look, I... For instance, and look, this is obviously easier for me to say because I'm not an oppressed minority, but like, yes, sure, there's way too many dead white guys in our history books, and, and we, we obscure all sorts of other voices. I get this, I, I do a, an email each month where I recommend books, and people will go like, where are the women on this list? And I always reply, what's a book you recommend? You know, don't just say that it's biased this way or that way. Like, give me a book recommendation. I have no, pro- like, I would we, love to. We get that with podcasts. You guys oh, should yeah. have more female hosts. I say, send me one. Yeah, of course. Send me one. We'd love to have them on here. Yeah. And and <laughs> and look, I also get, it's, it's my job to go be balanced and to explore. I'm not saying you should do my work for me. But the point is, like, don't just tear things down. Also, like... Uh, I wrote my first book when I was living in New Orleans. It's like, I don't think there should be a Robert E. Lee statue in the middle of town. Like, he's a fucking traitor. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't care about Robert E. Lee. But I think it's sad that they took the statue down and nobody can come up with any idea for what stat, like, who's a better person that should go there. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, like, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, I'd rather see Lil Wayne up there. Uh, <laughs> like, at least that's a person, you know, from New Orleans who like could maybe inspire some people. Right. Yeah. It, it seems like um, certain things matter more today than ever. Uh, when they were, when I was taught, they weren't supposed to. Sex, you know, so your gender, all of a sudden, matters like crazy. You know, I had somebody um, create this list and send it to me to, to complain and say the top podcasts are all hosted by men. There's not enough female podcasts. Yeah. I can't. Why does that matter all of a sudden so much more? Whereas when I was, the way I grew up was your it, it shouldn't matter what your gender is. If you do a good job, you do a good job. Or race, all of a sure. sudden it matters. Like, hey, what's going on? Do you think that's a symptom of what you were talking about with the media that they're just catching at people's attention? Yeah, I mean it's complicated because on the one hand, you know, people are like. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't matter, and we shouldn't be thinking about these things, but people used to say that, and then they kind of were also excluding people. Sure. Like, it's like, uh, it, it's like okay, maybe there's some excesses in the Me Too movement, but there were also some de- deficiencies in culture before that was allowing some of this shit to happen, right? Sure. Like, where were you? Like, people like, oh, this is excessive, and it's a miscarriage of justice. It was also a miscarriage of justice that nobody did anything about Harvey Weinstein for three decades or oh, whatever, yeah. right? So um, I, I think it, it's it's a complicated situation, and it can be easy to be, like, glib about it. But it is, it is strange that uh, all of a sudden, like, people's race and people's gender and people's background is now back to being the main thing about them. That's what I meant, yeah. And yeah. and I think that's heading in the wrong direction. Um it's uh it's, it's, not a, it's a weird. I think it's no. I think it's more normal than we realize. I think what it is is that and this has happened forever where we're extreme on one side, there's an autocorrect the other and sure. it swings the other direction. Now the yeah. difference today is the swings are harder and faster. Sure. So that's what I really think it is. I think, And I think that we can be a little alarmist sometimes, like, oh my God, fuck, we keep heading this direction, then yeah. we're all going to die, or everyone's going to kill each other, civil war is coming in, <laughs> in five years. It's like, eh. I think, I think we uh, should give ourselves more of the benefit of the doubt that we're smarter humans than that. Yeah. And a lot of this is just it's natural. There, is, there, was, there was a time for us to be speaking about those things, and there was definitely a time when a lot of people 
were being suppressed. And I think that we definitely should have auto corrected that. I just think it's a harder swing and faster now because of media yeah. and shit like that. That's what I really think it is. Well, and and one of the things that's I think really core to stoicism is they're just like, look, you got to zoom out. You can't you can't sweat the either swing because hum humanity has been swinging like this for that. So I think when you read like someone like Marcus Aurelius, he's just like. He's like, what were people doing three emperors ago? They were doing the same shit they're doing now. What are they going to be doing, you know, uh, three emperors from now? They're going to be doing the same shit. And and I think one of the what I'm what I'm saying, like, don't read the, don't watch the news or don't consume news. I'm saying replace that with the study of history, you know, with with studying bigger picture things because it helps you relax a little bit. So like I do think things are bad and we're sort of talking about where where there's problems, but like I also don't like wake up every morning stressed out. I go like, look, this is, things have been way worse than this. Right, right. Oh, to, yeah. your, to your point about uh, history and stuff. So you I actually um, really enjoyed the podcast that you did with Dr. Drew. Yeah. And you're you're quite the historian. Thanks. Uh, and is the, is there a historical story that you think more people should know? I mean, yeah, I, I feel like every story in my book, like uh, in, in my books, I'm like, I think you should know this. Like, here's a weird one. Like, I talk about Anne Frank in 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 the new book quite a bit. I was reading this study. There's more and more kids don't even know who that is, right? Like, there's people who don't even really under the Holocaust was so long ago now. It almost doesn't feel real to people. And so a lot of these like conspiracy theories that are popping up are partly a result of the fact that like, it's just inexplicable, like uh, it's nearly fantastic that that humans could have done such a horrible oh, thing. A but, point. but if you really study history, you're like, even the Holocaust, it's like, not the worst thing humans have done to each other. Like, we are awful. And, and we allow horrible things to happen on a pretty regular basis. And, and so you, you, history gives you, I think what history gives you a sense of is like what to be worried about and what to be really worried about. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the things that people get outraged about today matter like this much. And then what they're ignoring is the things that r are really actually terrifying. Like, you know, I, I was telling the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the book, just how close we came yeah. to nuclear annihilation and how much rested on this single... So so it's like, you know, people are like, oh, you know, Donald Trump is corrupt. That's why he shouldn't be president. Or Donald Trump is this. That's why he shouldn't be president. And it's like, I mean if you study what the temperament of the office requires historically, it's like all of that becomes moot and and it becomes obvious why this is a bad idea for, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, totally. I, it's like um, people get so mad with certain things about who's president. I think to them, I think to myself, they shouldn't have that much power to begin with. That's what really sure. matters because yeah. when they have too much power is when, yeah. and have you, are you familiar with the site, uh, humanprogress.org? No. Oh, phenomenal site. And it talks about all the statistics that are real, like how it's the safest time in human history, like how we've sure. lifted, you know, billions of people out of, out of poverty in the last, you know, uh, few decades, more than we've ever done in all of human history. But yeah, um, you get this sense we're like about to all die. Yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. Like, yeah. like people think it's so tumultuous politically and like yeah. this is the craziest time ever. Just look at the 60s and 70s. You had civil rights activists and leaders getting assassinated left and right. It was... No, in, in the 60s, there was something like 2,000 terrorist bombings in the United States by domestic left, domestic acts of domestic ter terrorism, mostly by left extreme left-wing groups, but some right-wing groups. Um, it was like every, almost every single day for like <laughs> 10 years, people were like throwing bombs and murdering cops and like, you know, yeah, the weather nuts. underground, right? Yeah. That was a real domestic terror group that was doing it crazy was crazy. shit, far worse than, than, it, than it is today. Um, I want to go back to when you first were introduced to stoicism. You were 19. Yeah. I think it was like Dr. That. Drew, right? Yeah. yeah now, it was Dr. Drew. Now Tell me about who you were before that and then who you became after that. Was it just a radical shift right away when you were introduced? I don't know if it was a radical shift, but I would say there was some transition where I went from being like just a kid to like um, what I would describe as a man. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think it was like, oh, this is what an adult does and thinks. Like, this is how, 
life is lived. Like this is what it means to take responsibility for yourself. This is what it means to have some idea of honor or integrity or self-respect. Like I think it was just I just remember sitting I was sitting in the um the like the the kitchen table in my college apartment and I was just and it was like no one's ever talked to me like this. Like, and then not that he's cri- not that Marcus Aurelius is critical, but it's more like he's like, no, you have this power, you have this responsibility, like, and it's incumbent upon you to sort of seize it and live up to it. Mm. And and you were you dropped out of college? I did not that long after that. No, what, that, did this play a role in you wanting to drop a, out? A little bit, a little bit. It was more like I was sort of on a track, uh, like I really wanted to be a writer, and so I'd gone and I'd met these uh, very successful writers through you know the fact that I was a journalist in college and just was like I was just looking for my shot, and I got a couple of them, and I thought I'm not going to come, I'm not going to turn down these opportunities to go back to a classroom and have someone who knows less about that topic teach me about it. Mm, that's a that's a big thing to understand at the age of 19 in college. Yeah, it and was very scary. Was there a lot of pushback from parents and Yeah, I mean it, it uh, I don't want to say my parents disowned me because it wasn't like a str- it wasn't that like clear but it was like a it was a not pleasant time. Like, <laughs> like, like uh, a lot of forgiveness had to happen afterwards. Wait, at what point were they like, okay, you made the right decision? Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know if there was a, an exact date, but like uh, it, it took a long, it took a long time for that to heal. Mm-hmm. Um, How much and, was that a driver for you? Uh, not, not really. I've never been that kind of person. I try to talk about this in the book. It's a real shitty way to live your life. Like, uh, I feel like anger or that sort of proving them wrong is a powerful fuel, but it's very corrosive. Right. So it kind of mm-hmm. eats at whatever the vessel that's holding it is. Yeah. Most people side. that most people that recognize that though had to go through it first before they piece it together. Yeah. I, I, I maybe that's just not how I'm built, or maybe I did go through it and I sort of learned. I don't know. I just the the problem is not only uh, yeah they're not even going to notice when you do prove them wrong because right. they don't care. Right. Uh, but but. It's not going to be whatever you think it's going to be. Um, I think for me, it, it was it was it was more it was more positive. It was more like um, so these people over here don't believe in me, but these people over here do believe in me. Mm. So I I, I I did try to go to the positive. Like I, I heard this from someone. It sounds a little cliche, but there it's like don't don't try to prove people wrong. Try to prove the people who believe in you right. right. And and I I, I definitely had. Uh, some really great mentors and and people who took a shot on me that in retrospect it's like I don't know how they saw it because I I uh, I didn't see it you know what I mean it's yeah. not like I was like I'm destined for greatness of course you're gonna take this bet it was it was more like like uh, it was it was it was really selfless when I think about it like yeah. that they they were like sort of bet on me and cultivated me and and supported me. But I, I think what I was primarily driven by was like not letting those people down, yeah. not thinking about the people who weren't supporting me. Do you remember like specific quotes or pieces of stoicism that like really like turned it on for you or something that you read and you're like, holy shit, that like just boom. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's been a continual process of that. Like what's so awesome about stoicism, there's this, it's actually in meditations, he says, um, like no man steps in the same river twice. And what he means is that like you're changing always and mm. f- events are changing. So it's like it's been it's been really incredible for me that this book I read when I was 20, and I've now read hundreds and hundreds of times, wow. is still teaching me mm-hmm. new things. And I think that's what really great wisdom does. Um, but I mean, at the at the core of that, just that idea of like, oh, you don't control what happens, you control you respond is like just like a sort of a very core life lesson that's helped me in business, it's helped me in relationships, it's helped me in traffic. You know, it's like getting upset about this does absolutely nothing. And in getting upset, I'm leaving the following other options uh, to rot. Mm -hmm. What in life challenges that for you the most? Like what happens to you in life where you're like, okay, I got to remember it's how I react and how I respond. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I do try to remind myself constantly as a writer, it's like I control the books that I write. 
I control the time I put into like marketing them or positioning them or promoting them. But like ultimately you can't make anyone buy anything and you can't make the New York Times decide to recognize it or whatever, right? Like you can only, there's too, way too many people hand over their personal happiness to, or they, they place it on the altar of like sort of professional success or recognition. And I mean, just think about how unfair the world is. Think about how many mm-hmm. people have been discriminated against, how many times nepotism got in the way of, you know, someone, uh, you know, some other person who more deserved it. Think about all the really brilliant artists or, you know, uh, visionaries who we made fun of, you know, like the world is not a meritocracy like at all. And so if you go around and go, hey, I did X, where's my reward for doing X? You're going to be continually crushed. Mm-hmm. You're a father, right? Yes. Yeah. How old is your, your son? I have, a, I have a three-year-old and a four-month-old. Oh, wow. Yeah. What have your children taught you? I mean, you want to talk about like what's not in your control is like you just... <laughs> <laughs> chaos. Yeah, it's chaos, but it's... It, um, it's just a reminder that like you're not you don't get to decide. Like I think I think especially as you become successful and you sort of become, you know, the driver of your own career or whatever, you it's very rare that you're not doing things the way you want to do them or on the schedule you want to do them and it's like hey, we left the house at noon to go to this thing at 1 um but then, you know, the kid fell asleep at 12:45. It's like, "Oh, actually the event starts when he wakes up, not when we <laughs> decide to go. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like uh, you're not in control. Like this small child is in control. Or, you know, you think this is fun, but actually they want to play with this cardboard box. So that's what you're going to do for the next like two hours. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, it's been just sort of a constant reminder of just like, just like going with it. Do you, do you ever think to yourself like, okay, you know, as my kids grow up, because I think your oldest was held four, three, four, four or three, as, as, he, as, they, as he grows up and, you know, becomes a teenager and the, the challenges get harder and harder. Do you ever think to yourself like, okay, I'm going to teach my kid like, hey, you know, this is, this is life. It's how you react to it. Do you yeah. feel like, what if he thinks I'm not being empathetic or, right. you know, sure. how am I going to yeah, communicate yeah. this to? No, it's tricky. I, I started a site uh, earlier this year called Daily Dad, and I sort of look at it's dailydad.com, and it's like try to take some of the same things I'm doing with stoicism, but just sort of ancient wisdom apply. The interesting thing is like people have been parents for literally <laughs> as long as there's been humans, right? And yet we're kind of like we're way too focused on like what the latest parenting study says or what the latest educational practice is. And what we don't think about is like, people have been doing a pretty good job for a, quite some time. And so uh, I think one of the things I'm, I'm always looking at is like, what is smart? What, if, what did people smarter than me tend to do? Mm. And what lessons can I learn from that? And how can I sort of practice them and follow them and you know, just remind myself of them? Can you share us some, some that you've learned? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the thing I was just telling you about not being in control, I, I read this story and I wrote an email about it. When David Brooks's son was born, someone sent him a letter and they said, welcome to the world of unavoidable reality. And what they meant <laughs> is like a lot of times, like you get to avoid things you don't want, like, you know, you get to decide. And then it's like, mm-hmm. you don't get to decide, you know, you thought you were going on a wonderful beach vacation and then both your kids got sick, you know, two seconds after you got to the hotel. And so actually your wonderful beach vacation is you sitting in a hotel room watching TV for the next three days. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that ties into another thing I learned. Jerry Seinfeld was giving an interview and he was talking about parents always talk about this idea of quality time. Like I want to have quality time. So that's like going to a museum or, you know, it's just me and you doing this. And he's like, fuck quality time. He's like, it's garbage time is the best time. <laughs> like, he's like, that weekend that you're stuck in a hotel room because you're all sick is not any less meaningful than you all being at Disneyland. And in fact, it's like the forcing the moments. You see those families in the arguments at Disneyland because they're like, mm. we paid so much money for this. <laughs> you need to enjoy it, you know? And, and that's something I've really tried to practice I don't have that much experience this is only three but just like no this is it like this is parenting parenting is not what you see in movies it's not these special moments it's just like I'm driving you to school and you're singing 
you know, or like isn't that we where you're trying walk to, this morning? Isn't that where you're trying to highlight the most in stillness is to be yes. able to recognize that those ordinary moments, totally but be super present. Yeah, I think people go, people think like beauty is like looking out over the Grand Canyon or something. That's like the easiest way to like be like, oh, isn't life wonderful? Can you say like, oh, isn't life wonderful as you're like sitting back in one of those crappy chairs at the airport because your flight's three hours delayed? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> can can you, can you like, can, it's not like, uh, yeah, it's not looking at, you know, your breath on a, uh, on a, you know, the top of a beautiful mountain, but it's just like noticing the way that the steam is coming up from the sewer when you're walking the, you know, down the block in New York City. Just like, can you notice just ordinary things about life and can you appreciate them and notice them and, and not try to, it's like, uh, why are we rushing through all this, right? right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Stoics go like, you know what's at the end? Death. <laughs> why, why are you, why are you, why are you rushing hurry? through this? Why are we running? Yeah. Exactly. Have you heard Jordan Peterson actually talk about this? So no. He on, on uh, I, I believe it was Joe's podcast that he did this. Rogan's? Yeah, he, he talked about, and this like changed my life, yeah. hearing this, this, this statement he makes. He goes, mm -hmm. and, he, and it's right along the lines that you're talking about with vacations and shit. We got a Disneyland trip planned next year. Year. We've already got a plan. We've spent hours figuring the hotel out, the look. I mean, and he talks about all this time spent for this seven, this seven day or three day trip you're going to do a year later. And he goes, when was the last time you thought about the first 10 minutes when you walk through the door and you see your wife every single day? Yeah. That you're going to do for the rest of your life and the total time the majority spent, of your time. Yeah, that's that's more of your life. Sure. That you will spend doing that than almost anything else. But how often do you think about that 10 minute moment that you walk in, what you say to her first, how you look and I was just like, fuck. You know? Yeah. No, no. People think, oh, I don't want him to watch this movie. There's like cursing in it, or I don't like this, uh, I don't like this bad friend who's an influence and then what you don't think about is like what behavior are you modeling they are watching you constantly and you're thinking about you know you're thinking about all these sort of big set pieces and you're sort of ignoring the day-to-day -day reality of who you are as a human being right um and and yeah it, it is weird though like we I, I see this with my parents it's like they'll come to visit and then it's like the important thing is like, did they check in for their flight in time? It's like you're here now, yeah. you know, like you're here now, and you're you. Who knows how much, you're, how many more times you can do this? Why are you Why are you ignoring it to get to remove some minor inconvenience in the future? Yeah. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. a, I, my daughter actually taught me uh, a lesson in that. We were driving uh, a couple hours to go somewhere, stuck in traffic, and I was super irritated because we were in traffic, and I'm visibly angry and my daughter's like why are you so mad and i'm like because we're not we're, we're going to be late for where we need to be and she's like well what's so good about where we're going to go i'm like because then we can all be together and yeah. she goes well we're together now and i'm like oh i guess you're right it's totally get schooled yeah it totally totally <laughs> yeah. Blew, blew my mind um what do your critics say about you do you have any critics of course if you don't have any critics you're not doing anything interesting. <laughs> right man. what do they say what are, the, what are their main criticisms well, wait, craig silverman 2012 oh yeah he didn't like you very much. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. Uh, <laughs> but what do I care what he thinks? You know right, what I mean? right, right. Excellent. Uh, yeah, he had this weird. He had this weird thing. Uh, yeah, I think he. So he was one of the first people to write about "Trust Me, I'm Lying," and he wrote something. It was like, it was like, uh, I, I was saying like, this is how the sausage gets made, and he was like, "Do you want to hear about it from the person?" who's making it was like yeah of course like right. who would you rather right. it was a weird thing uh but the the all, all those people it's like uh where are they now you know i don't i don't think about that that much <laughs> right. um i i have critics on on all the books you know it'll it, it's important when you have critics one like so epictetus has a line he's like when someone criticizes you you should think like if only they really knew me they'd be a I lot meaner that. i love that line. you know yeah. like i think that's really true um but but one of the other things I think about when I'm criticized is I go, like, okay, for instance, so people will go, oh, the, uh, they'll say like, oh, an ego is the enemy or Daily Stoic or, or stillness is the key. They're like, Ryan's not saying anything that the, that, that he's not saying anything new. And it's like, thanks. That's <laughs> like, you nailed exactly what yeah. I was trying to yeah, do. The like point. the point was I was supposed to take ancient wisdom and make it applicable for people. They'll go like, why not just read the original Stokes? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would love for them to do that. Like if you told me that nobody read my books, but however many you know millions of people have read my books, read the actual Stokes instead, 
I'd probably take that trade. You know, it'd be bad for me. I fin- it'd be bad for me financially, but good for the world, right? So, you you gotta um, you gotta think about. So, oftentimes, what people are saying critically is actually just rephrasing exactly whatever your intention was. You know, um, so like when you're saying like, "Hey, this is just popularizing stoicism," it's like. Thanks. You know, that's exactly (laughs) what I wanted to do. That's the goal. Brian Koppelman, uh, he wrote Rounders and Billions. He was telling me one time, I think he's talked about this in podcasts, when he went out for the script, uh, you know, um, for Rounders, people were like, uh, it feels like this is all just a bunch of, you know, people saying cool things in diet. Like he was like, there's too much. They, they were criticizing exactly like he and his partner had set out to write a movie that was super quotable. That was like a bunch of dudes, yeah. like saying cool things to each other. Yeah. Right. Splash the pot whenever the fuck I want. That's right. And <laughs> three stacks of high society. <laughs> See how good it works. Yeah. So yeah. And he's like, so, so you have to know when you're getting criticism, like just cause they're saying it doesn't mean it's bad. It might be exactly what you wanted to do. Right. And I think about that a lot. And, and obviously with books, you have editors, you have critics, you have your friends reading. One of the mistakes I see a lot of creative people make is that they take all criticism seriously rather than going like, does this person, one, have any credentials, they have any expertise in the subject matter? And two, do they actually understand what I was trying to accomplish? Because if the criticism helps me get closer to what I want to accomplish, then I'll listen. If the criticism is correct, but actually reaffirms what I was trying to do, then I don't have to listen. Mm. Right. Mm. What, what books are you are you reading now or what are some books that you've read that have really been impactful for you? Um, I mean, I'm always reading. Uh, I, I tend to kind of have two different types of reading. Like, There's like, hey, I think this would be cool. Maybe I'd learn from this. And more like I'm studying this person for something I'm going to mm. write about. I'm reading a, a really cool biography of uh, Douglas MacArthur that, that someone sent me right now that I'm, I'm fascinated in. Um... I really, I mentioned David Brooks earlier. I liked his book, The Second Mountain. Um, I think David Epstein's book, Range, is Mm. really good. I'd recommend that. Um, Have you read Eckhart Tolle? Uh, Yeah, here and there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I mean, he talks a lot about, you know, being in the present. But again, this is a message that's been echoed by... Of course. I mean, mean, we're all, he and I and all the people writing these books today are drawing from like the same... 25 sources. Mm-hmm. We're not inventing any of this. Well, that just tells me that there's truth there. Totally. When you hear it from different cultures and different people and different truth seekers, it just, and that it sounds very similar, just communicated in different ways, which I think is imp- it's important. I, think I don't think right. I don't think we can we need to appreciate how important it is that people communicate the same effective ideas differently because then mm-hmm. it reaches more people. Sure. You know, I think that's an, that's yeah, a, we need to be reminded of these ideas. I yeah. think, yeah. Like if we just keep going on we forget like where the truth lies. And so it's good to, to bring it back to the mm-hmm. surface. Mm-hmm. Ryan, are you money motivated? And in, in what sense? Well, I mean, yeah. I don't work for free, right. but, right, right. but, but, but are I, you driven by that? Or is that, uh, is that a major motivation for you? And if not, what is, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm driven by it. Uh, I think it's, it, it can sometimes be a proxy for like heading in the right direction, but in other times it can be evidence of the exact opposite, right? So the way I think, like for me, like autonomy is what I want. I want, uh, so there are lots of things that I've done in my life that that got me more money, but less autonomy and they made me unhappy. And then there's times I've turned down fairly large amounts of money or fairly cool opportunities that other people would have probably gladly said yes to that, that got me further away. So like, I kind of think about like, I don't think, I think less about like, let me accumulate as much money as possible. And I think more about like, what do I want my life to look like? And not like, how do we make it here? So then it could be here. So then it could be here, but more like day to day, what kind of life do I want to live? And then I think about and are the decisions that I'm making or the things I'm saying yes to or doing, is it moving me closer to that or further away from that? What do you, what do you think is that how you measure that? Do you think it's like a, a time money thing for you? Is it like this costs me this much time in order to create something like this to make so much money, which in turn you normally use to create more freedom anyways? Yeah, a little bit. I was talking to Casey Neistat one time and he was like, it's not a, you don't make, uh, he's like, you don't make art to make money you make money to make more art. And so one of the things I think about 
is like if I am going to do something like my rule for my my sort of creative agency, which has worked with a bunch of cool brands and, uh, you know, businesses and authors. And then when I'm like ghostwriting or other projects like that, I think like, OK, this is either something like if I'm weighing a project, it's either like this is something I'm really proud of or this gives me money that allows me to pursue work or things that I am proud of. So um, it's got to it's got to pass one of those tests. Yeah. Mm. Do you have a, a like a writing process, or there, is there a way that you get yourself in the space to be able to create what you create? Do you have like a formula yeah. for yourself? You have to. You can't. Like I think people think. Well, I think people think writers are just like you know live in some fantasy life, or that you sort of roll out of bed and just right. do it. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It it's uh it's it's a kind of like a. You have to have a routine. I don't want to say you're like a monk or something, but you 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 have to take care of yourself, you, and you have to have really good habits because it's such a long process. It's not, you know, the new book. Uh, you know, stillness probably took two years to write. You know, uh, probably three years from start to finish wow. on the whole thing, uh, from the thinking to the you know the the launch day a couple weeks ago, and so. That's not you don't you're not measuring three years in days like it's weeks or months right mm-hmm. and so if you're just like winging it that's you're not going to get where you need to go you you got to have a, and what I think is like you have good habits you have good processes you have good discipline what comes out of that is publishable work so mm-hmm. it's like I show up I do it every day day in and day out uh, and then it, out of the other side of that comes the stuff that I want. There are some, are there some things that you do for yourself that will help get you in that? And that, like, do you, do you have to like, I know people who listen to music yeah, they or have just to go for a write walk. a bunch of bullshit that doesn't go anywhere, you know, just get it out of your brain. Smoke some cigarettes. Yeah. So, so every, every morning, uh, so I wake up early and then, uh, my son and I would go for a long walk. Don't take the phone, long walk. Then I come in and I usually sit down with a journal uh, and I spend some you know, some time doing what they call morning pages, just sort of like knocking stuff out. And then I, I try to go just sort of right into the writing and mm-hmm. I try to get as much of it done as early as possible. Um, and that, so I'm very protective of that space. Mm-hmm. So my, my assistant basically never schedules anything before noon. Um, and even uh, my other rule is like basically nothing, no more than like three things a day. Obviously like being on book tour is a little bit different, but like, like I, I remember I sat her down with uh, my schedule and I was like, look, anytime you are scheduling things, I'm not writing in that time. And so your job is not to say yes to things, but to say no to things so I can have space to do this main thing. Mm. Are you in the pro? Are you writing something now? Yeah. I mean, I, I so this one just came out and then- Gosh, I'm, you have a book coming out and you're writing another one. <laughs> always. I'll, but I mean, that's how you, that's how you prevent the, the good- and the bad from from getting from hitting you too hard. Mm-hmm. Um, like uh, so, I found out yesterday it debuted at number one on the New York Times list. Oh wow! But you know, this morning I was back at it, and it was like hard, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so it you don't have time to think about the the good stuff. And it if it had you know been snubbed, I would have. Mm-hmm. I would have been too busy with the challenge to worry about the thing. You do, know? You, do you find the process of creating and writing because you're, you've done it now so many times getting easier or is it getting harder? Mm. It's, it's easier in some ways because you, you can predict where things are going a little bit, right? Okay. Like, so when things are really hard, I know like things are always hard at this stage or whatever, okay, right? There's a little bit of that. Um, like, I'm sure the first time Tiger Woods reinvents his swing, he has no idea whether he's going to come out the other side with a, an, a better swing. The second time he does, it's probably a little less scary. And the mm-hmm. third time, probably a little less scary. Um, so I'm sure it's the same with starting a company or, you know, skydiving or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, but it never, the, the blank page never gets any less blank. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. because I feel like the easier part would be, well, I've done this a few times. The hard part would be I got to come up with more great ideas and more great books, and I've already put out four or five or whatever. Nine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, no, it's it's uh, it's never it's never as good on the page as it is in your head. Mm. And the, the expression is like your last book will never write your next one. So you always are starting starting from scratch. But it's like, oh yeah, it's not any good. Were any of the books good at this stage? No, 
you know, so you just keep I going. It, so you have some, you have some more context or experience that allows you to sort of think think about it differently. Because you've been doing this so much, I mean, you you write blogs, you write, I mean, you're writing books all the time, you're writing emails, you're constantly creating content. Do you know, like, when you when you hit send, are you like, this is fire? Like, do, can you tell? And can you tell, like, uh, we'll see how this goes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you, I, I wrote this piece a while back. I, I sort of, to me, like, the, the thing I'm chasing is, like, that sound of the ball connecting with the bat. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, I, you can just really feel it sometimes. You're like, I, I really got under this one. You know, like I really got this in the right spot. Hit that flow state. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I just, I can just like, I can just hear that sound in my head and it's sort of like a, kind of like a mantra for me. Uh, so you're not thinking about the results. You're not thinking about where the ball's going. You're not thinking of the crowd. You're just thinking just the connecting part. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes you're like, okay, this this is this is gonna happen. Uh, this I really did it. Other times you're like, ah, did I get it? Did mm. I get there? And then you're surprised. Other times you're convinced you cracked it, and you know nobody cares. So it's 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 a, definitely an art, not a science. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you competitive with your last book, or is it a completely new thing every time? Um, you're competitive. So, I mean, you're competitive in the sense that it kind of benchmarks you a little bit, but like. You know, so the launch of this one, I think, is like four times what Ego was, which is awesome. But at the same time, like, wh- I'm, I'm, what I'm really not interested in is like week to week. Mm. Like, uh, I care, like, or, or did I make something that's got a shot at still being here in 10 years right. or something like that? I want to think longer term than, and I, I, I have the benefit now of looking at the sales numbers of the other books. And it's like, oh, launch week was less than 1% of overall sales. So why am I going to put too much significance on launch week one way or another? Right, right. Do you think that, because uh, since you do use it like a benchmark like that, and one of the things I think about right away is the conversation that we had with Mark Manson and his subtle art of not giving a fuck. Yeah. Like, do you think that's kind of almost a bad thing or would you, it, to be that early on in your writing career hmm. and hit something out that's chasing the damn Bible, it's like, how am I ever going <laughs> to, you're never going to top that, are you? Yeah. So I, I think I have this quote in the book. So somebody asked Joseph Heller, uh, he's the guy that wrote Catch Rain 2, that some you know snarky critic was like, you haven't written a, a book as good as Catch 22. And he was like, who has? <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so like Mark wrote a great book that sold a metric shit ton of copies. Like the idea that not doing that again is failure is just like preposterous. Right. Like, so I think, you know, when you're in that position, you've got to come up with some reasonable objective measurement of what success is I think that in would, isolation. I think it would be hard though, don't of you? Course, because it's it like saying be. a baseball, using the baseball analogy, like you had a, a year where you hit 20 home runs, yeah. you probably expect you're going to hit 20 home runs, but that's a great season. It's an incredible season. How but many people hit 20 home runs? That's really, the, that's why you have to always come back sort of to the present, which is like not comparing yourself to the past, not speculating about the future, but just like writing the best fucking book that you can, putting everything you have into the marketing, mm-hmm. not feeling like you left anything on the table or you were entitled. I think the I think what you tend to see is like all the good habits that went into the, one level like early success whether it's in sports or writing or whatever people abandon the second go around because they think they don't need to do it anymore Uh, you know what i mean so um pat riley says like the disease of me pull like he says the team has the innocent climb that's early on and then the disease of me pulls them apart the Mm. second when you try to repeat championships yeah so i think you know i think mark did a good job i think i've tried to do a good job it's like it's not how many copies, it's not, it's not like how many copies of the last book sell, but like what were the, what were the principles that went into making it a success? Cause ultimately that's what you control. Like, look, that book is such a, a monster hit. Obviously some of it has to do with timing and you can't recreate timing. And there, there are moments that I've had with my books, like Oh, this promo, you know, worked out better than expected because of some freak timing things. And there's bad things that have happened that were not my fault either. And so I got to tune all that out and go, like, what were the things I controlled as part of the process that I can replicate in rounds two, three, four, five? Mm. You had mentioned earlier that you really valued 
autonomy yeah. uh, quite a bit. Do you think this is like one of the the prevailing traits among all authors and maybe even entrepreneurs that we just value autonomy so much so we're like hey i don't want to work for someone else i want to be able to do my own thing yeah i mean just like not wanting to go to an office is probably a bad reason to be an entrepreneur but like <laughs> it, it, you know and i think some pe- everything else yeah. i think some people do 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 it that way i think it's more like it's like no i i want to be in control of my destiny i don't want other people telling me what I can and can't do. Like to me, what I love about being an author is like, if I write something more or less the way I wrote it is going to be how it comes out. Then I talk to people who, um, you know, work in Hollywood, they get paid. It's better. If you can, if you make it to like whatever my level is as an author translated to, to being a screenwriter would be, you know, a considerable pay increase. But, you know, people spend two years of their life writing a script and then some studio exec says, nope, not, mm-hmm. or they, you get fired Cut off your own project. Yeah. yeah. So, so ultimately I like being in control of the destiny more than I like some of the other things. Has this been a trait of yours since you were a kid? Have you I think in of- retrospect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you a, a good kid? Were you... I was a much better kid than uh, I think people thought I was. Like, I think people thought I was, you know, somewhat difficult to manage or whatever. But in retrospect, it's like, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, what would your parents say is the biggest pain in the ass about you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Probably the, that's what I mean. Probably the autonomy thing. But it's like, it's not like I wanted autonomy so I could go do heroin. You know, it's <laughs> like, uh, I want to write books, mom. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, excellent, Rebel. man. But, well, yeah. I, I, one, one last question I got to ask you. Uh, you know, book crushes it. Uh, big paycheck comes in the mail, goes in the check or in the, in the bank account. What's the first thing you go buy or spend money on? Yeah, I was actually, so I, I just sort of worked out a deal for what my next book will be. And, and it is like a pretty considerable check. Don't lie to us. What? It's a don't lie to us. What do you mean? How much it is. Uh, a half a million dollars, right? <laughs> uh, yes, right, 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 right. No, uh, more, more than that. Uh, but uh, but it, I, was, I was marveling to my wife that it's, I don't think, it doesn't really change anything. I think we've got... Like we, we have our life the way we want it. We I mostly do the things I want to do. Like I, I tried it. I've tried to set up my life and live from a place that there's not a lot of craving in it. Like there's not a lot of like, if only I had X, then I could do X. Um, if I really want to do something, I'll find a way to do it. I don't think money is like the best way to get there. Right. So yeah, like uh, if I had a, if I had a hundred million dollars, I don't think it would substantially change my life that much. If I lost, you know, 90% of my net worth, it wouldn't change my life that much. Right. That's kind of what stoicism is about. It's about getting to a place where it's really hard to rattle you right. because, or, or that it, you can't, you can rock the boat, but you can't capsize it. And so uh, that, that's not an easy place to get to. And it's taken some work, but um, no guilty pleasures though. Not really. No. Really. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You no, know, like an Iron Maiden concert, front row, VIP, back seat, like nothing like that. No, I. So <laughs> I, it's funny. So I spoke to the San Antonio Spurs uh, like two weeks ago, and uh, they they were like, "Hey, this is the offer. This is the thing." I said, "Look, uh, the night before the talk, Iron Maiden is playing at the AT and T Center." Uh, I'll come, but I want to the show. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, they, yeah. they like totally hooked They're me like, up. They're like, yeah, no problem. I, I, like, the, best, the best seats. It was amazing. That's uh, right. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, it's been a pleasure yeah, talking yeah, to you, man. man. Yeah, thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, we really yeah. appreciate the books you write. We think you're doing good work, well, man. thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, man. We'll have to link up when we're out in Texas. We're out there all the time. So, What do you guys go out there for? Uh, we Well, so we know the crew at Onnit uh, yeah. really well. I just uh, talked to Aubrey this morning. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Yeah, so we which is we are actually talking about that even because I know that some of the stuff, I saw your interview with him. And there, he, we kind of tease him of being like the pleasure seeker all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it was interesting that you guys that you guys connected because I feel like stoicism is kind of the opposite of that philosophy, right? Yeah, a little. I, yeah, you could say. Uh, Do you razz him uh, about uh, it or what? A little bit. I yeah. mean, Aubrey's Aubrey's a bit of an Epicurean, or you know, rather than a Stoic, I'd say mm-hmm. in in that element of it. But the other, I think, the core part of stoicism too is that it's like mind your own fucking business. You know, like, <laughs> like, like, like Aubrey's a cool dude. He's smart. We connect over the. Things things we like like what Aubrey does in his personal life has no 
you know, I, I'm not going to judge it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. Just like the fact that mine's very different from his has never been a, an issue that way. So yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the weird things about our society too, is like people seem to give way too much attention and energy towards like things that are really no. Meanwhile, to go to the parenting thing, meanwhile, they're sort of neglecting the stuff where they really do have influence. It's a weird, so a weird true. Give too many fucks yep. about the shit they shouldn't. Exactly. Uh, yeah. 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 And not enough fucks about their own shit. That's right. Yeah. Yep. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming yeah. on again. Yeah. yeah. Great right. show. Yeah. It's a rough.